Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> this will come out after Christmas. It is in the, yeah, it's yeah. the last Christmas movie we were watching for the month of December. Oh my gosh. Sorry. I'm just excited <laughs> that it's Christmas movie. It is Christmas movie. Yeah, because this will be after Christmas, so I hope we all had a nice Christmas. Mm-hmm. Gearing up for New Year's. Seeing it's almost New Year's when this comes out, what's your New Year's resolution? Asha, what's your New Year's resolution? Why are you making me say it Because I don't know one yet. Uh, my New Year's resolution is to actually watch online course lectures. Ah, mine too. Yeah, <laughs> good point. So relatable, yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's my resolution. What's yours? Jack? I think I want to kind of get back into a routine, start actually working on all the projects that I haven't been working on. So probably just... Getting a good routine and good worth I think. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Tom, what's yours? I don't have one. You have to make one. Don't have a New Year's resolution. My New Year's resolution is also to get a car. That's a good one. Mm. That's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Tom has a card, so I can't agree to Hopefully that. Hopefully, I have a better February. That's my New Year's re- resolution is have a better February than I did last year. Mm. Yeah, that was not great. Well, there we go. We found one for Tom. Yeah. Although, but your drama keeps me going. Your, <laughs> I love my mental drama. health breakdowns every three oh, months. That's like my favorite thing, Tom. You keep that up. No, it's my wait, favorite. No, no, no. <laughs> it's just like all the the Tom lore is so interesting. There's it goes so deep. There's so much trauma. Well, anyways, I think we have a special episode of the podcast. You've already seen what movie we're watching by the title, but we wanted to surprise Asha with a Christmas movie for the last. The last episode of December. So Asha, there's been one movie in particular that you keep talking about. And next episode of the podcast, which will come out after we recorded before, and you were talking about that one too. Is it Rudolph the Red Nose? It is Rudolph the, the Red Nose. The felt version? Reindeer. Yes. Felt version. Oh, Asha's, Asha's favorite movie. I love that movie. movie. It is one of my favorite movies. It's actually one of your favorite movies. like it's top five. Have I you guys seen really this movie? I know you're really excited. I don't think so. I Probably when I was a child. This is awesome. I watch this every year. I love this movie. Yeah. And it's a far better rendition of the North Pole. Oh, then <laughs> the yes, Polar than Express. Polar Express. I like it a lot. <laughs> I think we just need to go watch watch the movie. Yeah, we it's need a it. really good one. It's an awesome, awesome movie. I'm so excited to hear this. Let's go watch. Let's go watch it. Rudolph, I promise. As soon as this storm lets up, I'll find homes for all those misfit toys. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, made in 1964. I'm going to take this to Asha, because we watched this movie for Asha as a little surprise. You say you watch this movie every year. How do you feel this year watching it compared to when you were watching it as a kid, or when you watched it last year, or when you watched it a couple years ago? Yeah, like watching it for the purpose of the podcast rather than just watching yeah casually. sure i feel like i got an advantage well first of all it it never loses its magic it still has that nostalgic feel to it that it did ever every year that i've watched it which is literally every single year of my life interesting mm. i was able to take a lot of notes i took a lot because i've seen this so many times that i was like oh this is a really good part oh no this is my favorite part oh i love this part i love this movie it's really interesting, your notes between, like, my notes, where I just write, like, the most random things. Yours was so, like, particular and very well thought out. And I just thought it was really interesting, your English major coming out yes. compared to my, <laughs> just my random, my random notes. Yeah, I even named the note. But, yeah, I had different, well, it's because I'm used to taking notes in order to plan an essay. So I, I always, like, divide it into subtopics that I can make into little paragraphs. Usually I have little intro and conclusion parts, but I don't need that here because that's your guys' job. Sorry. Mm. Right. I also did research while I was watching the movie, like about the production. I was like, what makes this special? A lot, apparently. It's not just a Christmas jolly old thing. It's actually a lot. It's really cool. I yeah, love it. like we watched a little behind the scenes thing after, mm. right? Just to get some more insight oh, to I it. Always do. I'll always love that, watching a little behind the scenes thing. Something like kind of blew me away was just the history of that whole Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer thing, which I grew up knowing is just Christmas time spirit. 
it's kind of neat to see that the TV movie was just inspired directly off of like a little book that a guy made for kids and kind of became like a little pop culture thing, but now has grown to a level where it's like just Christmas. Like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is ingrained in Christmas for everyone around the world now. And it's kind of like interesting to see where it's like humble beginnings came from, right? Right. Yeah, like it was like the reindeer, because like I've always just been like it's it's dancer prancer comedy like i don't actually know the name but that was about all the reindeers and then in this it was just a matter of oh well like there's the new reindeer like like he wasn't necessarily flying with like they were the parents in this which is really interesting and that probably was weird for people just watching this special that already knew all this christmas stuff like that's just always been normal to me is that rudolph flying with all the other reindeer Right. In the case of this, it's actually like just all new reindeer. Yeah, he's like Prancer's kid or whatever, and like his yeah. his little girlfriend is Comet's kid, and it's like especially me having no idea any of what this movie was about to begin with. I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> it was a nice nice little take on it, you know. But it's kind of interesting how just like this little pop culture thing has succeeded the culture of the time, and is just now forever Christmas culture at least in our Western understanding of Christmas. I thought that was kind of interesting. This thing's almost 60 years old, you know, like, and it's still relevant. Asha still watches it every every year. And think about, like, how it's inspired more in Christmas culture as well. Like, think of how much, like, how much of Elf was inspired by this movie. Like, all of the North Pole very much was taken from this movie. Like, it's a lot of tv show christmas specials they'll do the little claymation thing in the style of this and it just it took off on its own because it like introduces a lore behind the whole like rudolph story right and you can see how it runs parallel with the song and they directly tie you in with that well by like literally referencing the lyrics of the song but it's so cool how it's like I don't know. The song is what a minute long, maybe, and this is like an hour long. So they're just adding more and more to the plot. I don't know. I like it. It builds the idea, and it was so early in the idea too. But the whole idea of what Christmas is, what is going on in the North Pole. So you're a bigger fan of Santa having like seven elves that sing and dance. Okay. <laughs> so over, first over of the all, Polar Expresses. I actually have a whole like. A whole category. You called... you want to you want to talk about how it was different. I have yeah, a whole category, it. a whole category called depiction of the North Pole, because in this, can I call it a film or do I have to call yeah, it a no, TV you, special? It's, to me, this to me actually going into this, I forgot it was that short. I yeah. thought it was a full movie. I didn't realize it was a Christmas special until we actually sat. I was like, oh wait, it's only an hour long. Anyway, sorry, continue. But yeah, so this portrays the North Pole in such a, in a much better way than Polar Express does. And that's probably why I hated Polar Express so much and I love this so much. Um, the first thing is it's a very like community type feel as opposed to like communism type feel. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Like where the elves were like, bowing down and like saluting to santa claus in polar express which was freaky it was freaky it was like a dictator like sh like relationship it was terrifying like Sorry, i went back to watch it again earlier today and it is so bizarre that is. scene is so great right it really start singing that song so slowly it's it quite is. worrying but then like and also do we see mrs claus in no. Polar Express, we don't see Mrs. We Claus. really don't focus on like it's such such and, a small part of the right. Movie. And the whole idea of like Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus, the two of them play such significant roles in like you know right in shaping what a lot of kids know of as Christmas. And I liked how it had Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus in here, and it was I thought it was kind of cute, but also a little bit odd, but kind of cute how they called each other Mama and Papa. <laughs> It gave like a little bit of a familial feel to the North Pole dynamic, right? right? Where like it's it's a big family as opposed to like a big business. How many other movies actually have a Mrs. Claus in it? A lot of them do. Because I know Elf doesn't really show Mrs. Claus. In the Santa Claus movies, there isn't one until he has to find a wife. Yeah. 
I wonder how much of our dislike for other Christmas things that don't depict Christmas a certain way comes from what we've learned from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Mm. Like you said, it's got such a familial feel. Mrs. Claus is very present. She's almost kind of like the boss Mm -hmm. in a way. Like she's really trying to get Santa to get on his, (laughs) get off his butt and like do stuff, you know, and get him around to take care of the elves and make sure the elves are being taken care of when Santa's just kind of annoyed by it. He wants Mm. to go hang out with the reindeer. She's trying to fatten him up for Christmas because she knows no one's going to want a skinny Santa. Like she's, she's the head honcho of that castle, 100%. Mm. I also like that it was a castle. It wasn't really a village. It was but, like an actual castle. But I wonder if we, <laughs> I wonder if we are so influenced by this history of Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer's like this movie, and now we actually like subconsciously judge other things to this depiction of the North Pole. Like I wonder what the connection is there. I kind of like the Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer depiction better because it's a lot more isolated. Like it feels a little bit more homey than Polar Express, but this one was more genuine feeling i don't know the whole idea of christmas isn't it well okay jesus but also when it comes to santa the whole idea of christmas is like he's going out of his way to like reward kids for being good right instead of like doing this out of obligation which is how the polar express seemed it seemed like they were running a business whereas this one was like oh he's doing it out of the good they're doing it because they like what they're doing in a sense i don't know it also kind of mirrors like to be fair where society was at the time that this was made mm. as opposed to the other one because like although okay industrial revolution comment part 300 although the industrial revolution was undergoing it wasn't like the world wasn't completely industrial you know That's but true. when polar express was made it it really was. So maybe in my heart, I just want the North Pole Village to stay as it always was with people hand making toys and singing little carols and all that jazz, you know? Which a bit, a little bit ironically, this was made as like a, it wasn't, the the TV special wasn't the general like electric ad, but they used advertising for the thing as in General Electric. They funded it, right, Asha? General Electric gave the producers $500,000, which is today's equivalent of $4.5 million to create mm. this movie. That's insane. That's a lot of money, That's isn't insane. it? That's the thing I keep forgetting when I think back to budgets for films. Is you got to, oh yeah, inflation, right. That's like way more money now. That's, that's, that's interesting though, because this is probably one of the only, I don't, I can't say this confidently to say it's one of the only, but it's definitely pioneering stop motion technology mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. back in the 60s right so do you have any information on that i, I well, feel like you might have. yeah like so it was called animagic it's a right. an, it, that's the animation technique they used which actually has roots in world war ii propaganda by the way just so you know so basically all the puppets they're puppets obviously um and they're made of like wood and felt and their joints are like movable their eyes are leather which is how they made like the eye yeah, i was wondering i'm wondering what you know was when up with rudolph's that. fake nose came off and like all the other rangers were like ah right yeah. like terrified that's how they did it because right. they can move those guys but that's also kind of why it was so expensive too uh each second of rudolph the red-nosed reindeer required 24 frames of animation so the whole movie took 18 months to create wow, and this is wild. like with hand carved puppets which alone are going to cost money to make obviously that's it's an art craft to create the puppets but it's interesting because now they have for i'll, I'll pick up nightmare uh, nightmare before yeah christmas. that one the nightmare before christmas movie like jack skellington they had like 18 or 24 different head models with all different facial expressions so like between each frame they just swap out the head mm. But then now as stop motion is getting even more intense, those bits, instead of it being 18 different heads, it's 18 different mouths mm-hmm. that are all coincided with other facial expressions. That you, like you can do so much. But with this stop motion, it barely looked like like they really only changed a mouth and an eye every so often, right. you know, like. They barely blinked. Yeah, I don't think they really ever blinked. Like especially other the than elves. the reindeer, the reindeer yeah. would blink, but very the rarely. Others I was wouldn't. I was trying to watch it because I was mainly trying to figure out what their eye skin was. And then like the mouth sync with the words that a character is saying is like become a huge thing, especially in stop motion. So the more accurate you can get a mouth shape to what the character is actually saying, the more believable for the audience. 
doesn't exist in this movie. It's just a couple of different mouths flapping, right? I wonder how they would have done that. Because this would, this would, it was back on film, so they would have just taken a like an actual film photo. But how would they have? I mean, I don't know how they do it. In- My best guess is a similar technique in the fact they have like a couple of different mouths, mm-hmm. a couple of different things, but they just swap it out between frames. The one thing I don't just don't understand about stop motion in general is how you like do the audio. That how do you sync that up to me? I don't. Oh, I have no idea. That's something. That's I never like the one about. thing I've never thought about with stop motion. I know, obviously, you record them separately. I'm sure there's technology for it now that actually helps you more. But thinking back on film, like, would it just be play a, a frame of an audio film, like audio tape, and then yeah, just see what... probably. I think that would maybe be the best thing. Like, film used to have a strip with a waveform on mm. it, with a real audio waveform on it, right? But that only happens once you marry your audio to your, yeah. your film negative, like once you've produced it. My best guess is they'd go pre-record all the audio. I know this was on Osh's fun fact list, was they recorded all the audio in Toronto, which especially you hear a lot of Canadian, Thucon Cornelius has a lot of Canadian references in there. Right, yeah. So on this side of the Hudson Bay, stuff yeah, like when that. his name is Yukon. Yeah, Cornelius. but they recorded it all in Toronto, and then the actual animation of it was done in Japan. Nice. In, uh, I think it was Tokyo. And I think he also said he liked working with the Japanese artists because they they were quick to share their creative ideas. They'll give you the criticism and they'll help you make it the best it could be, right? I think this would have blown people away. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Just like the Polar Express yeah. 2004, right? And with the light on his nose as well, that in itself would have been like, a huge deal to see on screen i was actually looking this up someone when we were watching the movie was like wait how is this lo- yeah, nose actually glowing time, yeah. yeah when and i looked it up it's a led light inside okay. of him but oddly enough the first led light bulb capable of emitting visible red light was made a year before the production wow. of rudolph the red nose reindeer began wow. so in 1962 the red led light was made that's cool that's so it's like really cool. insanely new and innovative technology that they just had in this so that had to be crazy for viewers to see and it must yeah. have oh yeah like some people probably had no idea what an led was by the time the movie came out yeah. mm-hmm. what really got me is because it's very difficult to animate light in stop motion to dim and brighten mm. the way his nose did which is what got me curious about it because you very much see his nose lighting up and then brightening down yeah, without like a full dimmer you can't really dim a tungsten bulb and i i feel like they used the dimmer for sure but animating that through stop motion for over the course of five frames to get it perfect to make it work the way it did actually was very impressive to me because i i know if i was ever trying to remake that i would have spent uh probably two days just trying to get one shot of his nose lighting up properly done i tried to do stop motion once in my life and it was just such a beast i couldn't get my head around like i struggled lighting it Mm. so much because our lights were just too big and hard like my shadows cast on my little lego figures just looked horrible and it was like maybe an hour into the day i was like this is just falling apart so i'm always shocked and blown away by stop motion studios and people who can actually do that art because it's just insane it is bananas <laughs> it's bananas it's, it's bananas, bananas in it. It. okay it's it's time to stand up and stretch for a minute uh we'll be right back hey listener if you like this podcast and you haven't followed yet we'd really appreciate it if you really like this podcast please leave a review on apple podcast each follow and review really helps bring our show to new listeners you can also subscribe to our Patreon to get extended ad-free episodes and bonus episodes too. Visit patreon.com slash vanish entertainment. All right, let's jump back into it. To be fair, we've talked about the whole Christmas thing. We've talked about some of the technologicals. How does it hold up as a story, do you think? I think it's cute. Do you think it has a good message? I think so. What is the message, Jackson? Quite honestly, I feel like it's a good little thing for kids kind of just seeing like you may feel like you're, you know, different and excluded, but you know, you can you can find community with other people who are excluded and mm-hmm. it's like the little island of misfit toys. And then you find out in the end that they've changed it. They redid some of the movie after they actually finished it. Which changes up lots of the ending and stuff. 
which where the one song right when he meets when Rudolph Fritz meets Hermie, they have that little nitwit misfit song. They redid that. And the one we watched that was the original song. But they did a whole other song about like fame and success, hmm. which is really weird. Wait, what? Yeah. When? In the one we just watched? No, it, it was they remade it after because they felt that song was too harsh. Oh. But also the whole ending was very different. So, for example, why Cornelius kept licking his pickaxe. Originally, <laughs> sorry. the whole thing was that he was looking for peppermint. Yeah. But they changed up like the silver and gold song, which he was originally didn't sing, not the snowman. They changed that song, and then in the end, they added a scene where he found Peppermint Mine. Yeah. And that yeah. wasn't in the original. Oh, that was in the one we watched, yes. though. Which, this was a weird mix. Yeah. And then also, right after the first airing of it, originally it just ends with Santa's like, thanks for helping us, Rudolph, let's go. Mm-hmm. And then they don't go back to the Out of the Mist at Twice. So they got all these complaint letters, NBC and General Electric's got these complaint letters of being like, what about the toys? What about the toys? Yeah. So they redid an ending of it where he goes back to get the toys and then they deliver right. the toys. Right. Where it just used to end them just throwing presents. Right. That's fun. It also made me think, could you do that with like any other movie and it not be weird that they changed the movie? Because like, there's like stuff with like director's cuts where it's this whole big deal about, well, you're changing right. the movie, right? Where this is like a Christmas special where people just know different versions of it. Like the people that originally watched it is completely different to like what we would have watched now. Right. Right. And that's really bizarre to me that like with the Christmas special, it's just kind of more, it's more open story where it's fine that you can just kind of flip flop it, right? The off topic. Do you see the SpongeBob one? They reanimated the SpongeBob movie. No. So you I've never n- seen the SpongeBob. Movie. You've never seen the SpongeBob. That's a, such a good movie. That's the whole thing with me here. It's You've on this podcast. Se- I've never seen anything. I so thought it was just... gonna be all me that's never seen it. I, I thought it was shocked. gonna be me who has never seen anything. No, because no, I really I, because I haven't seen anything really. Like this movie wasn't amazing. I was like, oh, that's weird. They just, out of nowhere, just killed the abominable snowman, dropped them off a cliff. That's also not how I remembered it. That is how I remember it. But I, I feel like every film. part of the story has meaning. There's, It's purposeful. Everything is purpose. I loved the meaning of this story, even when I was a little kid. It's like like everybody has a purpose. That was a big thing that I noticed in it. Like Everyone who was like a misfit, a quote-unquote misfit, like ended up playing a significant role at some point in the movie. Like Yukon uses his mining experience to knock out Bumble and then Hermie uses his dental abilities to mm. take out all of Bumble's teeth. Oh, that's I didn't thus even eliminating his threat. Yeah. Um, oh, so his name is Bumble? Yeah. yeah Bumble oh, ends up putting the star on the tree so he has a purpose too. <laughs> that, was, that was really funny. I and, like that at the end. Like Rudolph obviously leads the sled through the garb weather yeah. and the misfit toys get rehomed at least in this version like i i can't make a judgment on this because it's not like filmmaking as a craft and like what goes now as what you consider a good movie wasn't c- the same thing back in 1964 right. so i can't i can't comfortably cl- cast a blanket and say yeah this movie was bad and that's not necessarily what I'm trying to say either, because like it's a Christmas movie. It, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy. It's very cute. It's wrapped up in like a little bow with like all the characters, right? Like mm. they all have their per- and it has their message and it means a lot. So just looking at it through the lens of today, it's be- being someone who's never watched it, it's like kind of almost funny how not polished it is. Mm. I think is what I'm more trying to say. Like it's not a polished movie. But then I also can't just say that comfortably because it's like it was made in 1964. It's a TV special movie with brand new technology that like not many people have used before. You know, so it's It's also quite bizarre. I know. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting you. It's also quite bizarre how critical we are that everything like does have to be polished or else it's just it's not liked. Right. Yeah. That's something so weird with watching Polar Express and watching this. It's just like. This was just insane at the time. Like, I fully remember watching Polar Express and just being in awe of it. Now I go back and everyone's just like, oh, no. Oh, this looks terrible. Because, like, right? Like, it's just so critical of stuff now. Yeah, it's like everything actually gets kind of deep with the way our culture perceives things and takes things in is 
it's always the next shiny thing that comes along, the next best toy that comes along. You put your old toy down just to play with the new thing. I think we, we really take that into consideration with our movies subconsciously. So we'll look back at Polar Express now, having seen all the Marvel movies mm. where a purple alien looks photo real. Mm. And we'll look at Polar Express and be like, oh, that's awful. Yeah. But then back when the Polar Express came out, it was like, oh, this is amazing. Like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer sucks, you know? And then yeah. people who, when Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer comes out, they'll be like, oh, this is amazing. The little Nickelodeon machine thing sucks. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it contributes to the message that it's giving. Mm. Like, because even though it's not picture perfect per se, it's still meaningful and yeah. it paved the way for so many Christmas movies in the mm -hmm. past and it keeps it genuine in a sense, you know? I love how it's sometimes choppy and how sometimes you'll see like those little black dots go across the yeah, screen, right? Yeah, the I really do yeah. like that part. It makes you feel more nostalgic as well. Yeah. And honestly, for a 1964 film, this, this, it was woke as Heck. Yeah. It was actually I mean, it was, really woke. It was, it was, like with in, with regard no no bit. no but with regard to like gendered stereotypes and stuff like uh, that, yeah. it was so woke. Did you guys catch Clarice and Mrs. Donner saying like just completely ignoring Donner's comment that searching for Rudolph was man's work and going out on their own and doing it? Like they are girl bosses. But I'll also jump on that and say they didn't even give Mrs. Donner a real name. Yeah, that was silly. You know what I mean? And then the characters, I guess Mrs. Donner and Clarice, they like exercised fuck youism <laughs> to Donner when he was being like all mean, which is dope. But then like there's just a lot of abuse in that movie. <laughs> like Rudolph was born with a red nose and Santa was just like, oh, no, I hate you. You're never going to be part of the team. And then Christmas gets canceled and then Santa's like, wait, I can use you. You're great now. like. But I feel like there would the be song. no plot without it because the whole point is that it's more the like whole plot though. is promoting the, I don't know, support of nonconformity and the acceptance of nonconformity in a sense, right? Right. But That's a good point. Like at the end, it's, I feel like Santa's turning point in this one was where he goes to the island of misfits because that's not like using them for his own gain that's like right. doing it out of the goodness of his heart right but i don't know i feel like obviously the alienation and all that jazz in the beginning was like off-putting and it's like wait what are you trying to spread that santa's like mean and exclusionary of his own reindeer or whatever but it it contributes to his character development yeah. i think that's a good point i agree with that and I also liked the like the wokeness in the gendered colors. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. Like at the beginning, um, oh, like with the where the or were... you know where the orchestra is happening, right? Yeah. And um, they're obviously supposed to be portrayed as like elves who are fitting in and they're doing things however they want. Like they're doing things the way that Santa wants. Okay, mm -hmm. they're conforming to North Pole standards, <laughs> and the male elves are wearing blue and the female elves are wearing pink. But then it's disrupted when the three male characters, being Rudolph, Hermie, and Yukon Cornelius uh, go to the island of misfits mm. and then when they go to sleep in that little room they're allowed it's like a pink themed yeah. room with pink blankets pink pillows like dainty little curtains so I don't know I thought it was nicely it was a good representation it was woke that yeah it was woke that they don't need to conform to these strict gender expectations of the north pole because they're allowed to do whatever they want on the island of misfits right I kind of mm. liked it I liked the wokeness in this movie, even though it, maybe that's not the point at all. It actually isn't right. at all. But it was a nice little tidbit. Yeah, that's just a nice thing you throw in to show that it's like there's changes happening in your hmm. culture. You know, like the creators obviously made that decision, right? It's not yeah. like they just happened to end up that way. Like that was a decision made by the directors or the production teams, which in one way or another is a way to push the mold that they would have been in prior, right? Mm -hmm. And writing that specifically into the story, whether it's big and supposed to be like big and in your face about nonconformity and stuff, or small like it is in the movie, it's like, oh, it's kind of like almost like a trick of the people who conform to the old ways of that. Where it's like, oh, look, you didn't care when everyone was sleeping with pink blankets and stuff, so you're actually 
<laughs> you're fine with it. You know, it's like same with Cornelius's sled dogs. I, <laughs> yeah, loved I love that. how I love his sled dogs were like house pets, not like huskies. There's like poodles and cocker spaniels and like English bulldogs. I loved that because it's like almost a reference to how uh, Yukon Cornelius is someone who like accepts and supports the idea of nonconformity because he's not put like he didn't mm. go out of his way to get a uniform force of husky sled dogs right he, he just even, picked up whoever was there and he doesn't have to show that he has to show them how to yeah, run the, pull exactly. the sled and they all just jump on the back and he's the same character who like as soon as he meets rudolph and Hermie, he's not like questioning them he's not saying oh why is your nose glowing or why do you want to be a dentist he's like oh okay cool sounds good let's go on an adventure i'm right? looking for silver and gold yeah <laughs> like i don't know i feel like they do really good like character growth character well like symbolic representations of how a character is supposed to be portrayed you know mm. what i'm saying like with his sled dogs i feel like that alone seeing him come in with that weird pack of dogs was like telling before he even spoke mm. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you get that? I don't know. Yeah, definitely. But I wonder also if, just to flip the script, because I know I just agreed with you on that. I wonder if they just did that to be funny. Do you think people back then would have just been like, oh, let's just make a sled dog team without any huskies and like put poodles because right. it'd be funny? Do you think they would have thought about that to be pushing the mold and be like, oh, he, we don't want him to conform to anything? Or do you think the decision was us, it'd be funny? I feel like that happens a lot in film where it's just a matter of you never really know the intentions of the filmmaker. So lots of times people are just like, oh, yeah, this means this. Yeah. And then that we just adopt that assumption of it where you never you really never know. It's like um, it's like the cooler shot effect where you see a shot of a man staring at something emotionless and then you cut to, um, I think, one's food and then you cut back to him and then suddenly he's looks hungry even though his expression didn't actually change you cut to a little girl and you cut back to him and he seems happier even though his expression like stuff like that where it's just like you can assume whatever as an audience based off of what we're showing you it doesn't have to be the intention of it, right it's just what you see in it and that's that's such a, a strong part of filmmaking is how an audience is going to receive something rather than to your actual intention yeah were you ever taught when writing a script your script will always be written three different times. When you write your script, you actually put the pen to the paper and write your script. And the second major rewrite it goes through is on the day of shoot, where you change the entire script to make sure you can just shoot whatever you're possibly able to shoot. And then the third major rewrite is when the audience watches it and makes their own opinions of what you made. I will never know what the intended idea behind Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is. It's just like a little advertising thing for General Electric. Yeah, you it, never know really. It could what, have been all just for money. But we're sitting here talking about how it breaks conformity, how we're pushing gender more. Like, you know what I mean? Like, It's all what you take out of it. Exactly. Whether that was the intended thing, then the filmmakers did their job to a T. Hmm. But if that's not what they intended at all. They could have just been all really sexist. Yeah. You never know. But we're sitting here getting different meaning out of it, which will then influence our decisions and our growth as humans in society. And it's now like changed an entire different generation of people and what they view media through the lens of kind of thing. Like they might get another completely different. They might find after watching this movie that Santa's an abusive, horrible piece of poo <laughs> and Christmas in 20 years will be canceled kind of thing. Like, yeah. You never know, right? And it's all based on people who watch your movie and how much they believe in what you made. I think definitely I agree because I'm like, if I showed my grandpa this movie, he's from obviously a different generation. I feel like he would perceive it completely different. And instead of being like, oh, wow, Clarice and Mrs. Donner are girl bosses for like, going out even though Donner told them not to he would be like wow this is showing you how when women are not under the supervision of men who are superior they go off the rail and commit criminal acts or wow uh, Mrs. Donner is a smoking piece of meat something like that you know <laughs> um, you're really going at everyone Asha I love my grandpa but he would definitely say that <laughs> but it's diff it's interesting how I'm probably only perceiving it this way because I am 
an English major who is graded based off my ability to pick apart every film and create meaning when there is no meaning. So I just create meaning out of nothing as a default at this point. I go into watching these movies for the podcast based on how they make me feel and based on the criteria of does it hold my attention through the story the whole way through, how much I'm invested by it, and did I enjoy it? Mm. If I put any more effort into analyzing a movie, I feel like I would almost ruin it for myself now Mm. because I did do that when I was hot off of college and I was just analyzing like every movie for every hidden meaning it could ever have. And I was just like getting tired of watching movies. (laughs) So now I'm just like back into the point where I want to watch a movie just to enjoy watching a movie. It all depends on the outlook you're hoping to get out of a movie when you go into it. Yeah, like real talk, those different dogs were most likely just to physically distinguish him like as a mm, quote unquote misfit, like part of that quote unquote misfit gang, because all of those misfits have they have physical distinguishing factors, right? That make them like somewhat odd, like Rudolph, obviously, with his red nose, Hermie with his he has a completely different face from he's, all the other elves. He's not, he doesn't even have pointy ears. He does, he has, yeah, he looks he completely hair. different. Yeah. Uh, him, Mr. What's his name? Oh my gosh, Yukon Cornelius, okay? Mm-hmm. And his like crazy pack of dogs. And then all the misfit toys, they all like physically look, except for that one doll. That one doll looks completely normal. And <laughs> there's so many theories on the internet saying that she's depressed, <laughs> saying that the reason she's on the island of misfits is because she has depression. I'm like, wait, where is this coming from though? Well, uh, wasn't Yukon Cornelius your childhood crush? mine yes I'm jealous absolutely no. no doubt about but it yes going back to that he's kind of hot eh? <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that that's kind of cool because it doesn't devalue what you took out away from it right mm. like your opinion on those dogs meaning to break like societal norms is completely valid and works like in the movie like it works like that mm-hmm. and that's a cool thing like you can apply that to this movie and show it to someone and say Look at how Yukon Cornelius is breaking societal norms, and they can watch that and agree. And then you could also be like, wow, look how Yukon Cornelius is enforcing patriarchal standards through uh, (laughs) taking Bumble hostage and making Bumble work for him. Yeah. And making these dogs work for him and blah, blah, blah. Like, you could... Yeah. I kind of the- like this movie because it's so... Oh, you can literally say whatever you want and then you can see it. You know what I'm saying? You can spin this movie with 89 billion different pieces of yarn and it will work one way or another. Anyways. But it's fun. I think I really like just sitting and chatting about movies. Hmm. And I really like that we were able to share this movie with our viewers. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad y'all shared this with me. It's a great Thanks, movie, Sasha. isn't it? I feel like this is... um like a deep piece of your history and it is actually i feel like happy that i was able to be exposed to it do you understand why i think that polar express is so dystopian now like it's a complete switch up did you see that little that little like they're hand making the toys in polar express what's it called like the utility line that's what they're doing in polar express like they're like completely assembly line yeah assembly line like it's just they had a handmade assembly line in that i can't believe we're gonna end a podcast about rudolph the red-nosed reindeer with another polar Express. i'm not gonna let it go (laughs) i'm not i just hate it not Rudolph the Red Nose. Just to clarify, I love Rudolph the Red Nose. Oh, oh, really? It's Polar you Express love Pol- that I dislike. I love that even know. in the Polar Express episode, you talked about how much you love Rudolph the Red Nose. Yeah, it's because I do. It's my favorite Christmas movie, without a doubt. Yeah, I think this is a good time to wrap it up. Yeah, we've been chit chatting for a that, while. I really, I really do love chatting with you guys, and especially with all this cozy Christmas decorations and Christmas movies. It's been, it's been a fun little December. Yeah. All right. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye. Merry Christmas. Well, I guess Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We hope everyone had a phenomenal Christmas, and we hope everyone has a very safe and great New Year's. Uh, Or holidays. And go watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Felt Edition if you haven't already. Felt Edition. Okay. All right, Uh, Asha. Tell me everything you hate about Polar Express. Go. Go. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Okay, bye. Bye. Hey there, I'm Jackson's mom, and this has been Mixed Reviews with Tom McMahon, Jackson Brotherton, and our in-host genius, Asha Joseph. This episode was mixed, mastered, and edited by The Old Man Dave. Be sure to follow our podcast on your favorite podcast app and join our Patreon for extended, ad-free, and bonus episodes. The link is in the show notes. This has been a Vanish Entertainment production. Thank you for listening.